welcome to Inbuilding Solutions Distributed Antenna System DAS webinar. So in this webinar, we'll talk about these main topics. First of all, we'll go through RAN introduction. So we'll see what are the various parts of RAN and how RAN evolved from 1G to 5G. Then we'll talk about what is IBS, in building Solutions. Why is IBS? important right and then we'll talk about ibs system requirements what are the coverage requirements capacity requirements and the interference requirement then we'll go through buildings architectures so we have various kinds of buildings it can be stadium hospital uh, underground railway stations tunnels etc right so we will talk about what are the various characteristics of those buildings and what are the unique requirements of each building according to das right then we'll talk about uh, we'll go through repeaters, small cell, leaky cables. And in the end, we'll see what are the types of DAS, like active DAS, passive DAS, and the hybrid DAS. Right? So as I said, there are various types of DAS, right? like leaky cable, active DAS, passive DAS, and the hybrid DAS. So one thing that it's important that the radio designer should know the basics of all the various types of indoor coverage distribution solutions. Because in many projects, the best solution will be combination of various types of distribution hardware. And good indoor radio planning is all about well-equipped toolbox. So suppose if you have only hammer in your toolbox, yes, and hammer can solve many of your problems, but only hammer in your toolkit will limit your possibility, right? So indoor radio planning is not about using one approach only. So learn the pros and cons of all the various types of designing indoor coverage. And then you will know what is the best approach for design at hand, right? Because often the best approach will be the combination of different solution types. First of all, thanks a lot for joining this training. And I really appreciate from core of my heart for giving me your precious time. And I will try my best to make every second of your work through this session. Again, this is me. My name is Gaurav Goyal. I have been in telecom industry for over 18 years, mostly in the wireless industry. And I have worked in telecom in one capacity or another. And I have worked for all the largest telecom service providers in the US like AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, etc. And also with major vendors like Nokia, Ericsson, Huawei, etc. And mostly in the in building DAS. And in addition to this, I worked with InfoVista as product manager and solution consultant for their Planet tool. And before coming to US, I have worked in various countries like India, Nigeria, Japan, Finland, UK, etc. So much of time has been spent in wireless networks only. And I have begun my career with 2G and now working with 5G for at least last four years. And at this moment, my focus is on 5G, Python, ORAN, and the in building solutions. Okay, lucky friends, this is about me. And and for more details about me, you can check my LinkedIn profile. So here is the link of my LinkedIn profile. So linkedin.com slash in slash Gaurav dash Goyal dash 5G. Okay, so this is all about me. And these are my ID cards of few of the companies where I work. And as I said by Albert Einstein, that only source of knowledge is experience. So try to get as much experience as possible. And before jumping to the topic, I want to say one thing. Your involvement in the class is critical for you to benefit most from this webinar. I request you, if it is not absolute necessity, then please close your any kind of Outlook, Facebook, WhatsApp, if possible, right? So it's proven fact that there's no such thing in the world called multitask. Even a genius can't do two tasks at the same time. So it's my kind appeal to everybody. Please close all kind of social media or, or any kind of distraction. Also, please stay till then because I may offer some lots of bonuses and offers on my complete 5G course, right? So are you with me? So if you are with me, then please write yes in the chat box. Okay, then let's move to the next slide. So this is a list of abbreviation we will use here. So let's move to the wireless world so to set up the stage let's talk about the mobile network coverage right i know everyone must know about it but we must revise it before jumping to the ibs because it will act as our base so so radio access networks so they are commonly known as cell sites as well so these are the strategically placed to provide wireless coverage to users within a specific geographical area you can sit all around you okay the placement of radio access network or RAN components is critical to ensure that users have reliable connection. So when you are planning the deployment of a radio access network, network operators consider various factors to design for coverage and the capacity. Factors can be, you can say that uh, like population density, it can be related to topography, it can be related to building density, it can be related to traffic pattern, right? 
so there can be many many factors so by analyzing these factors network operators can determine the optimal location and the configuration of rack the ultimate aim is to ensure maximum coverage and the capacity so like for example in urban areas with high population density network operators may need to deploy more cell sites with lower output power so that each site can provide coverage to smaller areas but we need large number of sites so that we can cover our high population density but in the rural areas with lower population density network operators may need to deploy fewer sites with higher output power to provide coverage to larger areas okay so thousand of radio access elements create seamless coverage and the mobility so whenever you want to go from one place from like uh, virginia to california so you will have a seamless coverage so you will you will not make a drop call right so wireless telecom system okay so wireless telecommunication systems components are composed of three main components or parts so we have user terminal right so examples can be smartphones tablets laptops and other mobile devices basically any kind of wireless devices the user terminal is connected to ran wirelessly or you can say through the air interface so the ran is responsible for providing the wireless connectivity required for mobile device so the radio access network includes different parts like uh, you can say antenna system then it can be radio or you can say rru nowadays or it can be baseband unit right so ran consists of mainly three parts antennas radio and bvus yes it will include cpri also but uh, that may not be con uh, considered as a component okay so these are these two are connected through an air interface and we are using a wireless connectivity and the radio access network is also connected to the core network so the core network is responsible for managing the overall operation of the network so there are different means to connect the core network and the radio access network so these can be connected through microwave wirelessly or physical cable or the fiber op and if there is challenge in terrain or large distances you may use a satellite to interconnect this so example can be connection to ships aeroplanes so most of the time these use they use satellite for wireless connectivity okay so these are the main components of a wireless telecom system and you have the user terminals connected to the radio access network and the core net so have you ever stopped to think about how your mobile device or cell phone is able to connect to the internet how you are able to make calls and text while you are on the go it's all thanks to radio access network that is all around you okay so next time you are out take a look around so you will likely see cell towers and antennas on a top of a building along the side of a road and even in the mountain or even inside the malls so this type of antennas are inside the mall and we call it the in building solutions okay ibs so some people call it wifi access point but it is not the wifi access point it is an omnidirectional antenna or sometimes an active antenna that belongs to the radio access network okay so we'll talk about this in our today's session so what is radio access network again so so this is the part of the wireless telecom system that is nearest to the subscribers okay so you is uh, you see it all around you okay so you can see it in the malls you can see it on the mountains rooftops wall wall mounted on a building the location is widely distributed so you can see it everywhere since ran creates seamless coverage and mobility okay so ran is all around you okay so what is radio access network so as you know ran has evolved from first generation to the fifth generation and each generation is improving upon the last but essential components are the same uh, we have antennas so these convert electromagnetic signals to radio waves and the vice versa and then you have radio unit so radio unit act as a transceiver they transmit and receive the user signals to the base station and the vice versa and third one is the base band unit and it is used for signal processing network access so this component processes the signal it contains software and hardware to do that and it makes wireless communication possible over the radio wave okay so this is how ran evolved from 1g to 5g we have discussed in detail in our last webinar as well but you should know that first of all we have 1g that is analog system then we move to 2g that is digital system and then 3g which is the foundation of mobile broadband 
and 4G, which is further enhanced mobile broadband. And then we have 5G, which has many, many new cases. If you know that we have EMBB, right? We have URLLC and we have MMB. PC, right? So we have EMBB, URLLC and MMTC. So many uh, cases are introduced in case of 5. And you should also know the names of various RAN generations as well. So in 2G, we call it GE RAN. Okay. In case of 3G, we call it UTRAN. In case of 4G, we call it EUTRAN. And in 5G, we call it NG RAN, right? So this also we have covered in our previous session. So please go through because I'm not going in details of these topics, but at least you should know the names. What are the RAN technology name in case of 4G, 5G, 3G and 2G. And you should know the basic function of baseband unit as well. So BBU is typically located below the tower in the traditional network. And this is responsible for providing the processing of the baseband signal and it is placed in the equipment room in the traditional network and connected to RRU through an optical file, right? I'm talking about traditional and these are the basic functions of BBU and we don't have to go in detail. So when I share the PDF, you can read these things like the, the BBU main components and functions can be uh, DSP, for, uh, forward error control, modulation and demodulation, channel estimation and the radio resource management. And then we have this remote radio unit. So this is how RU look like if you have not seen it before. So and main functions of RU, it acts as a transceiver, transmit and receive the user signals to the base station and the vice versa. And then we have this CIPRI, CPRI, right? So this is called the common public radio interface. So it enables the high speed transmission of data over a fiber optic cable. It allows the RRU and the BBU connection. So this is the common public radio interface and nowadays it is not necessary that basement is near the tower basement can be centralized location as well so cipri is an interface that sends data from rru to the baseband unit and it is a serial interface which is very high speed connection basically it's a way to translate all those radio signals back to the computing function and just to let you know that there is a new thing introduced, which is called eCIPRI in case of 5G. For your information, like CIPRI is TDM based and eCIPRI is packet. Okay. Then let's see the evolution of RAN. So RAN is a critical component of the wireless communication. It provides coverage and connectivity to the mobile device. And there are several RAN architecture available. So there are several RAN architecture available today. And each of them have a unique strengths and the trade-off. The choice of RAN architecture will depend on the range of factors. So it may depend on the specific use case or the network topology or available resources or the performance requirement. So operators can optimize their network performance. So in the RAN evolution, first we have seen that we have this traditional network. So this is the traditional RAN architecture. So this is the traditional RAN architecture that has been used for many years for technology like 2G up to LTE. Okay. So it consists of separate baseband and radio units which has connected through dedicated fiber or the copper cables. So the cell sites are the baseband and the RRU are located in the cell site premise and it has various version like non-split right in non-splits rru and bbu are co-located on the side then you have this split version where rru and bbu are connected by the cipri and bbu ru interface are the proprietary right so same like this here baseband units radio units are located inside the premises of the cell site and this is non-split scenario right and then it evolves to the centralized network so it emerged because we have need for more flexible and cost effective solutions so it uses a centralized process you need to support a multiple remote radio heads and these are connected by a high speed fiber optic links right so this approach can help to reduce cost and improve the network efficient and then it becomes the virtualized network so virtualized network builds on the benefit of CRAN. actually it is CRAN as well but it adds the virtualization technology okay the idea is to further improve efficiency and the scalability. And then we have this open RAN. So the open RAN, now we have the core network, but your basement is now separated into centralized unit and the distributed unit. And then you have the radio unit. Okay. So there is separation. The functionality is already split. And then the 
cloud native function the gpp hardware meaning you are also using a general purpose hardware or the core hardware and the software defined networks and the interfaces are open meaning you can mix and match different vendors to the different vendors of the ru to the cu or the du okay so this is how the open ran is different from the virtualized ran okay so you remove the uh, proprietary equipment this is how the open ran differ from the traditional ran and then we have this open ran or 5g architecture and the new interfaces so you should also know the name so between cu and the core we have the backhaul between du and cu we have f1 interface in case of user plane we have this f1 u and in case of control plane we have f1 c right and then between du and ru we have this front hall connection or you can say it is connected through the eSAPRI and function of all these things RU, DU, CU, Core, or Cloud we have discussed in, in our previous session as well and this also we have discussed that we should know the layers which are the protocols so for remote unit main protocols used are lower physical layer and the RF and for distributed unit we have RLC, MAC and higher physical layer and for centralized unit we have RRC and PDCP for the control plane and SDAP and pdcp for the user okay okay then we have this different ran structure so the radio access networks comes in the different form so when we say different form it is either an outdoor or an indoor solutions or a different kind of structure so we have different form of radio access network in terms of their structure so we have this kind of outdoor solutions like sst which is also called self-support tower. Then we have this rooftop site and then we have these Gaia towers. So what is Gaia tower? A Gaia tower or Gaia mast is a tall, thin vertical structure. And why it is called Gaia tower? Because it depends on the Gaia lines. It requires Gaia lines to stay upright to resist lateral forces like um, wind loads or heavy winds, right? And then we have these emergency sites or we call it the cow, the cell sites, the cell site on the wheels. And then we have these uh, monopole towers. After that, we have these como place sites. So what is como place tower? So como place tower means any tower that due to appearance hides the presence of the tower. And then we have what you call wall mounted site and lastly the private net. So now the question comes, how does a radio access network provides the mobile coverage. So this is a typical area where we want to have a mobile cover, meaning we want to have a signal in our telephone or the mobile phone, right? So we need to build these, these kind of structures. So this is a typical example of outdoor radio access network. When we powered up this outdoor radio access network, it will give us the mobile coverage. So the colors that you have seen are the indicators of how strong will be the signal if you build a radio access network in that particular area. For example, this dark blue, right? This dark blue will be the areas where coverage will be the full bar. Okay. So you can see that we have signal maybe more than negative 75. But if you go further from the side, you will have some another shade of blue, maybe light blue, right? But if you go indoor, you will have the another shade. You will have another kind of signal level. It may be NAG 95, NAG 105 or so on. So getting far away from the radio access network or cell site, our signal level or the received signal level goes down. Right. So this is a main principle. So it is a combination of distance from the site and the path loss. Okay. So how the obstruction in the area, where are the, where are you located indoors or outdoors, population, do, uh, topography. So these factors will affect the signal strength. Okay. So now the question comes, where are the users? So users are everywhere. So they move, they're in the offices, at home, maybe at the port of entry of railways, airports, shopping centers, and all these things, right? But they are mostly inside and rarely outside. So now the question comes, how to guarantee sufficient coverage level inside of the building is the macro cell level is enough to penetrate inside buildings and we should also know that how do radio waves travel and behave inside the building right okay so you will see again building malls hospitals other establishments so if you deploy a typical macro site, it is not enough to cover big buildings inside. It is not enough. So you can design an antenna pointing towards the building, but most of the time it is not sufficient. So IBS is one of the effective ways to solve this problem in the indoor, in terms of coverage, capacity, and the quality. So, okay, you can see here, 
So these are the areas, right? So these are maybe some buildings here. So these are the area in the populated region of this map. So it seems that they are weak signals, especially if these are passing through indoor or a building structure. Okay. So why it is like? Because the electromagnetic energy or you can say RF signal is being blocked. Okay. So due to walls, it tends to get weaker. Okay. So what is the impact of the obstruction and the structures on the electromagnetic energy? So that's why there is a limitation on the wireless signal. So to cover population in the building, we need some better solution. So the better solution is called the in-building solution. So what is the in-building solution or what is IBS? So this is the cellular service inside the building to provide better coverage, capacity and the quality. It uses a distributed antenna system or DAS, distributed antenna system. So you are distributing the antenna in the entire building. So what's the purpose? Now the purpose is to evenly distribute the signals in all the target area. So this is all about RAN and the IBS. Now we'll go deep in the IBS in the next few slides. Okay. So let's move to the next part in building wireless world. So what is IBS in building solutions? So cellular service inside the building to provide coverage, capacity and the quality. And it uses DAS distributed antenna system to evenly distribute signals in all the target areas. So why is in building coverage important? So as I said earlier that 80% of the call and data sessions are initiated indoors. So why it is important? So let's take one typical example. Let's divide our normal 24 hours. So just imagine from 12 to 6 a.m. Look, we have seven hours. So probably you are sleeping or preparing yourself to the work. So that is seven hours or you can say 29% of the 24 hour in a day's lives okay and then maybe one hour travel so that is four percent outdoor and then when you go to office work in the office so you will have like, like 8 a.m until 7 or 5 p.m so if you're like that your boss will not ask you to do some um, overtime so that is 10 hours already and that is equivalent to almost 42 percent of your 24 hour life in a day okay and then you go out again so you will travel probably two hours stuck in traffic from 6 to 8 pm and that is equivalent to eight percent and then again you go to your office rest watch netflix or doing some online courses so you will have this four hour you will spend four hour in your house like whenever i come back home at least for two hours i try to study new things new technologies maybe in building or and cloud whatever right so i spend at least two hours studying every day so and then you sleep so that is equivalent to 17 percent so if you see the typical life of a professional just 12 percent are spent outdoors that's why we need in building solution so again if we take one more example you can see here if you have line of sight, you will have good coverage, right? So this person has a good coverage. But if you go indoor, now that start of bad coverage, right? So if you go inside, so this lady may get the bad signal. So that's why we need indoor. That's why in building coverage is important. So, so as you know that you may be served by one sector or one cell resources, but you are not only one that is served by that source or sectors. That's why in building solutions are very important. Okay. So people are concentrated inside the building and different establishments where most of high traffic are generated voice and data. Overall, if you put IBS, the subscriber experience will be impacted. That's why it's very important. Now it's very important to have in building solutions to improve the operator's revenue, right? So just think when you do not have a good capacity and the quality, you will not browse much. You open one app and if it is not opening quickly, you just kill the application and the put the phone back in your pocket. So now just think the change in the behavior of your subscribers when you have a good coverage and the capacity. So you motivate to watch YouTube, Netflix, high definition videos, right? So people will start to browse the internet. So they will try to open their social media and watch some videos there, right? So we call it traffic. So just imagine how big will be the revenue if you deploy an IBS site in an area so you can see that when there is no ibs site and we have only macro so traffic increase from here to here like this and we have this much traffic at this particular moment when we don't have ibs but the moment we put ibs our traffic increase from this point 
to this point right but in the end as the time goes our traffic increased like this right so earlier we have up to this point and then it increased to this point in the graph it looks like that our traffic increased two to three times as compared to macro outdoor cell when we install our ibs cell site right so that's why it's very important that before deploying an ibs site one should do deep analysis in terms of the business case because the cost of deploying an IBS site is very high. Okay. So it's not only the equipment, it's not only the services, but the acquisition, okay, the cost of the design, okay, and the implementation and also the optimization. So many things involved here. Okay. So let's move to the in-building tool. So one of the my favorite tool for in-building design planning and everything is IBW. So IBW is the one of the best tool for in-building. And IBW is a global provider for innovation in the building wireless software solutions. The motive is to help operators, system integrators, and the equipment manufacturers better design and plan the multi-technology wireless network inside the buildings and the venues. And IBW is a global leader at innovating and the delivering the software solutions. It keeps the world connected with simpler and the faster designs for in-building wireless networks. The great point is that these designs are quite affordable, right? And it has maybe 1,000 companies worldwide who can trust this tool, IBW. And I'm using this tool for many, many years. And I, if you think that one thing I can't survive in in-building design and planning, that is IBW. And it supports all phases in the network design, be it survey, dimensioning, engineering, install, commission, and the operator maintenance. So because it has various devices like IBW Mobile, IBW Design, IBW Unit, right? So it has IBW Design, Unity, Mobile, and Wi-Fi. And it has various optional modules like propagation, optimization, and the collection. In short, this is the best tool for in-building design planning and the optimization. And I'm using it for many, many years. It takes my work so much efficient and the productive. And then let's talk about the building architect. So where do we need to deploy IBS? Can you please write in the chat box where you need IBS? Okay. Okay. Thanks for the right answer. So here are the few examples you all mentioned in the chat box. So let's talk about things to care in the IBS system in the next slide. So uh, where do we need IBS? It can be offices, industries, airports, tunnels, high-rise buildings, hospitals, hotels, and the stadiums and there can be many more examples okay thanks for the right answer so here are the few examples we have discussed and now let's talk about things to care in the ibs system so first of all we have to think of the rf requirements so first of all we have to think what kind of technology we are going to deploy be it lte 5g 3g or 2g but normally but normally we are talking about lte and 5g nowadays so what kind of frequency band you are going to use be it 800, 700, AWS, millimeter waves, 28 gigahertz, 39 gigahertz. So this question you should ask. And then we have to, then we have to think of integration. What kind of operators we are using? Is it single operator solutions? Is it multi-operator solutions? It is it like single technology or the multiple technology? And because the later is particularly important for multi-operator, multi-technology design. Because sufficient agreement among all parties must be established and a perfect coordination should be arranged at all times, be it during the design process, installation process, commissioning process. The aim is we should guarantee that performance is not affected for any of the participating operators. So these are the RF requirements. Apart from RF requirements, so in-building design should have some building specific. It may be related to aesthetics that color of cable, color of antenna should match our walls and our buildings. Then we have this cable types. So we should think of the rigidity, diameter, and fiber retardant compliance. We have to do the, we have to think of the working arrangement as well. Also physical aspect design like heat, power supply, and the cable stand. So as the building is going to be modified in certain way, so we should also communicate properly with the building owner and operator for their specific requirements. For example, a very critical aspect can be where to put the antenna. What's the antenna's location, where we can put? An RF expert may have some optimal solution for antennas to maximize the coverage, capacity, and the quality. But building owners may not agree with such installation since it may affect the aesthetics or the certain spaces or it may be difficult to install antennas there, right? 
So compromise should always be made between owner operator and the building and the dash installers, right? Now let's talk about different characteristics of the building. So we have seen different types of building where dash can be utilized to improve coverage and the capacity like stadiums and the ballparks, casinos, hotels, airports, office buildings, shopping centers, theme parks, right? So now, now, now let's talk about the characteristics of different kinds of buildings. Each building has a unique property. By knowing them, it will be very easy to design that particular venue. So in addition to RF requirements, we must consider some relevant issue as well which are dependent on the nature and the type of building. So what are the common RF signal propagation inhibitors? Can you write some of the issues we face for wireless while signal travel from one place to other? Okay, so thanks for the right answer. So as you know that radio signals are electromagnetic waves that travel freely through the air and they can be absorbed, reflected, refracted and diffracted by various materials. But after 9-11, we have stricter building codes for metallic qualities in glass and stronger steel supports to new buildings. So we may have issues related to linocyte issues, dense tree cover. We may have issues related to metro downtown and neighboring buildings, dense construction materials like glass, steel, blocks and bridges, dense interior walls and the furniture scheme. In addition to that, we have issues related to underground structures such as basement and the military basis. So these are the common propagation inhibitors, right? So let's talk about issues in different kinds of buildings. So first one is the high rise building. So for high rise buildings, first issue is related to interference since they have direct line of sight from a macro site. This can interfere with our IBS solution. Also, since these facilities have large number of floors coverage, so handover inside the elevator is important. And data rate should be distributed across the building, especially at the higher level for the office spaces. In addition to that, aesthetics and the future capacity demands as the number of users inside the building grows is also very important. So you have to think of that as well. The second important kind of buildings are the airport. So airports is a place where we can uh, congregate a very large, a very high density of users. So it is especially important for operators who can capitalize on roamers arriving to the country. The problem is that airport layout is very challenging. It has very little number of floors. It, it may not have like 20 floors or 50 floors, but the problem is that the floor area is very large, right? And it may have challenging propagation spaces like atriums, right? So sectorization is important for airports as well as proper design for handover areas with low subscriber density. And we should guarantee the handovers with the outdoor cells as well. And in the case of airports, we have to take care of tarmac as well, right? It is also called ramp and it is also called apron as well, right? And this is the photo of the uh, Vienna airport. And I once went to this city and this airport. And this is my one of the favorite city in the whole world. If I given chance, I will stay my whole life in this Vienna city, right? In Austria. Okay, let me write Vienna Airport, Austria. And then we have these road tunnels. So in general, only coverage at low capacity is required in the road tunnels. Thus, the solution for road tunnel structure is achieved using repeaters or maybe uh, any kind of uh, low power BTS. So interference is very low in these cases, but handover is very important because cars can come at high speed, low speed. So handover is very important in case of road tunnel. Then we have these metro tunnels or you can say underground tunnels. So they have similar requirements as compared to road tunnels. But in addition to that, they have capacity requirement as well because we may have stations where large people of large number of people uh, congregate, right? So coverage level plus capacity is important in the metro or the underground tunnels. And then we have sports stadium. This is one of the most complex dash design we can do and it has high P capacity requirements and all things related to dedicated coverage, right? And I will give one more complete session on sports stadium design, maybe next week or uh, maybe next few days. So a sports stadium is one of the complex. So we have to talk in detail of sports stadium in the complete session. Okay, so next topic is types of IBS. So there are several types of IBS solution possible. It can be repeaters, it can be small cells, it can be 
passive dash it can be active dash it can be hybrid dash it can be leaky cable and it can be rf over pipe so there can be many other solution possible but in this session we'll talk about all these solutions like repeaters small cells leaky cables passive dash active dash hybrid dash and the rf over pipe okay. so this is the basic concept of uh, dash so once a radio signal is inside the building coming from a donor outdoor cell or through a dedicated pico cell it must be distributed across the building so a dash splits the transmitted power among several antenna elements installed in the distributed environment separated in space so to provide coverage over the same areas as a single antenna but with a reduced total power and the improved reliability so this is possible because less power is wasted in overcoming two things one is penetration one is penetration and second one is shadowing so due to which our line of sight present is more frequently right our los is more frequent then due to which our coverage is improved our signal is improved and because we have less fade depths and reduce the delay spread so this is the basic concept of the dash so as i said there are various types of dash we'll talk in detail all about these types of ibs so but in this slide let's talk about what are the names of different types of ibs so it can be repeaters it can be passive active or hybrid dash it can be small cells it can be leaky feeders right so let's talk about our first solution which is repeaters as i said earlier that it's important for radio designer to learn the basics of all types of indoor coverage solution possible because indoor radio planning is not about using one approach only we should know the pros and cons of all the solutions possible because only then we can have efficient solution our only aim is that we should give the best solution possible in the least amount of money used right so we should learn all kind of solution possible in case of ibs so first one is repeaters so when we say repeaters it means signal is amplified right it's like a coverage amplifier or the coverage extender right so it, this is a coverage amplifier or you can say coverage extender right so it extends your coverage so you can see there is an existing outdoor site right so this is an existing outdoor site right and existing outdoor site feed this particular antenna so we call it donor antenna okay and then it will feed to an amplifier so here we can use one amplifier so here they are feed to an amplifier okay so what happens here is that there is an improvement in the coverage because it will amplify the signal and then you will distribute the signal inside the building but a source in an existing outdoor site so it will improve your coverage inside the building but there will not be any improvement in the capacity because you are using the capacity of the macro site only you are just using the capacity of the macro site so in building repeaters are the active devices used to overcome the path loss between the macro cell and the in building uses why because due to high losses produced by the walls and other buildings partitions it may not be possible to penetrate those walls but with the help of this repeater we can penetrate those walls as well because we have better line of sight with the help of those dash antennas and the idea of providing coverage using a repeater is to use a highly directional antenna called a donor antenna pointing to serving macro cell site the downlink signal is amplified in both direction that's why i call bi direction amplifier because signals are amplified uplink as well as downlink right so the downlink signal is amplified in both directions on the other hand uplink signals for each mobile users are amplified through the bi direction amplifier and sent back to the donor site with the help of this donor antenna okay so what are the major applications of repeaters so the repeaters are used to extend coverage to weak or the unserved areas in places where dedicated capacity is not required in other words the use of repeaters can be seen as a means of distributing available capacity right so it will improve your coverage but not capacity right so capacity will not be improved by the repeaters and what are the various advantages of repeaters so the use of repeaters to provide in building coverage is very popular since it involves low acquisition and the operational cost and the technique has also provided to be reliable for extending coverage and also to create a 
dominant area right because it improves the quality of signal and what are the some issues that must be taken into account while designing in building using repeaters so first of all uh, we have to take care of this bidirection amplifier gain right so gain must be chosen to combat signal losses through distribution in a dash right and additional losses due to splitters and tap should be also look up during our link budget stays right then we have to take care of our noise floor level as well so there is noise increase due to loss in a bda so special care should be taken with noise floor level in both sides of the bda and then we have to take care of automatic gain control as well for clear for repeater solution and then placement of bda is also very important and it is recommended that it should be placed as close to the donor antenna as possible because then we can minimize our losses we can minimize our noise factor and as i said earlier that a repeater can extend coverage inside the building but at the expense of stealing capacity from the donor macro cell so it's a good solution when you want to improve your coverage but it's not a good solution if you want to improve your capacity as well so for capacity it is not a good Solution. So here is one example of node A. So one example of repeater. So this is the example of like node A. So that is coming from Comscope. So the picture is taken from internet. So it has various features, but two important features I like is that it supports up to four frequency bands or it can support four operators and it is available both in the medium and high power class. Okay. So this is the one example of repeater node A from the Comscope. So if you go to internet, if you go to Google, you can just type Node A Comscope and you can all the details of this repeater. So you can see that it has various components like full band RF card and it is available in both medium or high power option, right? It has main power and it has integrated multi band combiner and the modem. So let's jump to the small cell. Now let's talk about small cell. Okay. So small, what, so what is small cell? So a small cell is a mini base station, especially designed to extend the data capacity, speed and efficiency of a cellular network. So these low power radio access nodes can be deployed indoors or outdoors. And they usually have range from uh, 10 meters to a few kilometers. And mobile operators use small cells to extend their service coverage as well as capacity. And their smaller range enables operators to use the same spectrum at the short distances and therefore significantly increase the network efficiency. So according to report, at this moment, there are around 12 million small cells deployed across the globe and this number is forecasted to increase up to 70 million by 2025 so you can see that the job market may also improve so if you have a knowledge of small cell then it can help you to get a good job or promotion in your company so they are an important element of network densification so they add more base station connected to the existing wireless structure right so the small cell be connected to the core mobile network through the internet. So indoor small cells can be done through broadband or it can be connected through a backhaul solution. So depending on the specific needs of the customers and the venue of and the venue owner, small cells can be used to enhance the coverage and the capacity where a macro tower based solution would either be not feasible or the suboptimal. The small solution is provided to improve signal strength and the speech quality and the coverage so why small cells so these reasons we already discussed as uh, similar to dash so improve the coverage of signal improve the coverage in the basement improve the capacity and offloading the macro site so what are the various types of small cells we have three types of small cells available one is Femto cell, one is pico cell, and the last one is micro cell. So what is femto cell? So this is the smallest type of small cell that covers the radius of around 10 to 100 meters and can be used in the home networks. So in scenarios where a person has access to high speed broadband, a femto cell can be installed. The femto cell transforms a high speed broadband connection into a cellular service that can be used to make phone calls or send and receive SMS text message as well. The second one is our pico cell, right? So pico cell covers the radius of around 200 meters and the pico cells are usually placed at places where there is a high crowd density like during the festivals, uh, during game in a stadium, concerts and other large gadgets. So 
eco cells are larger than the femto cells and then we have this micro cell so micro cells are the largest form of small cell that can cover an area maybe up to 2 kilometers and they are typically used to provide services in the remote areas like villages or in the dense urban the aim is to improve service at the blind spot caused by the line of sight issues right our dash the main function of dash is improve our line of sight so our users should be in the line of sight as much as possible so that our quality may be improved our signer may be improved all this right so every small cell is basically a cell on its own it is a complete base station plus the antenna in one box so if i write here so first of all they have it has base station plus antenna in one box right it is a bit like an access point in wi-fi and every small cell has its own capacity but it will interfere with all other cells they are connected to the ethernet switches and the switches are connected to a controller so the controller takes care of the connection to the core network of the operator and then there is a backhaul and then it is connected to the core network so this is the high level architecture of a small cell right so these are a few advantages and disadvantages so it is relatively cheap to deploy but it has this uh, some disadvantages like single operator only and it has one or two bands supported on Right. Let's talk about some of the small cell vendors. So one of the important vendor is the Cornic small cell. So you can see the basic structure. So you can see here, first of all, we have these radio nodes. Then we have this POE switches, power over Ethernet switches. Then we have this aggregate switches. And then we have this service node. And that is connected to the back hall. Right. So we have two parts. One is front hall and one is back hall. So in the front hall, the radio is connected to the service node. In case of back hall, the service node is connected to the core with the help of copper or the fiber cable. And these are the few examples of the Corning family. It can be SGRN 310220 and so on, right? And each has different properties or the characteristics like uh, uh, this RN520 and the 530 supports the millimeter waves so 520 will support 28 gigahertz 53 will support 39 gigahertz and also on right so uh, i will provide the pdf so you will get the details of all these nodes so it has basically three parts as i said one is radio node one is service node and spider net to manage a small cell deployment and this is the basic structure which we have already discussed it consists of service nodes power supply ethernet switch and radio node and the service node right service node ensure that it is easy to deploy and manage and it delivers the performance mobile operator expect it is you can say the heart of avron or it is the brain of the small cell and then we have this aggregation switch and it can be used to fan out to the multiple power of power over the ethernet switches right and then we have this poe which is power over ethernet right on copper cables mm -hmm. using poe switches right and the maximum length can be 328 feet or you can say 100 meters and uh and according to this 802.3 standard class 4 is up to 25.5 watts but their radios can hold or can tolerate 30 watts per radio node and this is a radio naming convention so if you see that sgr if you see SCRN 3100413, it means small cell radio node, and 310 is the model number of radio node, and 04 is the like band 4, and 13 is the band 13, right? So, this is a naming convention. So, then we have this Ericsson. So, the solution, small cell solution for Ericsson is called R dot. So, it is called the radio dot, and it has the similar components like we have radio node, we have switches, we have controller, and then that is connected to the backhaul right and all this available is on the internet so you can go through and just press google so in google just write r dot ericsson and then you will get all those details and for comscope small cell solution is called one cell so one cell delivers a clear mobile signal through a building of a virtually any size and this ruggedized radio point extends the signals to the outdoor spaces as well such as courtyards and the parking lots as well so it has similar parts like baseband controllers and radio points and all this and examples can be here is like rp 5000 so this is a multi-carrier and it can support up to four frequency band okay and then we have this rp 2000 right and it is highly impact and it is used for single frequency okay so these are the solutions and for nokia the solution is called acid air scale 
indoor solutions right air scale indoor radio solutions so this is the so we have discussed for corning solutions we have discussed comscope uh, solution we have discussed ericsson solution and we have discussed nokia solutions right and these are the huawei solutions as well and then we have to talk about this leaky cable so leaky cable is a kind of a coaxial cable it has an outdoor conductor with the periodic slots the cable makes part of electrical wave propagated through the cable so it radiates outside by these periodic slots the electrical field is almost the circular symmetry and it can be utilized for radio communication to the moving object the generated electrical field is confined around the leaky coaxial cable therefore the cable can be used very conveniently for the radio communication in the limited locations examples can be roads tunnels uh, area along the railway or the underground roads right so what is leaky feeder again so leaky feeder cable is also called a radiating cable so as you know that one if we have antenna right if we have one antenna it radiates right antenna radiates but there is a cable between repeater and the antenna this cable is not radiating but in case of leaky cable the cable is also radiating okay so this cable is also radiating so it is doing the two functions first of all the it's radiating as well moreover the leaky figure will also transfer a signal from this place to other so it is doing the two functions right so a leaky feeder behaves like a very long antennas for radios because it allows the signal to reach where it may not be possible without these leaky cables right so so in circumstances like tunnel works where it is impractical to install a network of traditional rf antennas we can use this leaky cables so when i was working in london so i was working on this uh, uh, one station called this uh, let me write the name tottenham court road underground i was working on this project uh, so it is in london and so the challenge here was that the staff needed to be able to communicate from underground to above ground and it should penetrate thick layers of concrete the solution was to install a leaky feeder antenna system so installing a leaky feeder allow the staff working underground to have communication with the workers above the ground level and which is very vital for the smooth running of the underground tunnel and few years back i worked on this ohare blue line station in chicago as well here also we have used the leaky cables as well again leaky cable is also known as the radiating cable and this is a cable with many regular slots distributed along the cable the cable run is the antennas and the radiates cylindrically along the cable axis the radiation coverage is mainly in the near field and hence less energy tends to propagate outside building compared to a traditional antenna also leaky cable tends to have more uniform coverage but the coverage doesn't extend very far from the cable generally leaky cables is passively fed and is compatible with the multiple frequency band the main difficulty with leaky coax rf distribution is the cable and the connector installation and it's the associated cost so what happens the cables can be large in diameter so diameter can go up to maybe uh, one inch and so it's difficult to band around the tight corners generally we use like a half inch cable for indoors so leaky cables has some problem related to installation right so this is all about leaky cables so next topic is rf over fiber so one common type of dash use a combination of rf and the optical fiber technology so the rf power from the base station is converted to optical by a main fiber unit which is transmitted to remote fiber unit this is our remote fiber unit so after the signal is transmitted from main fiber unit the signal is converted to rf with the help of this remote unit so this allows very low losses between two fiber units and hence the distance between antenna elements at base unit can be maximized right it can be between 2 to 20 kilometers so what happens is that suppose so let me write this also so this is our optical fiber and this is our you can say coaxial okay so generally what happens a fiber cable has generally loss of around around 0.5 db per kilometer right so for 2 kilometer the loss can be around 1 db right right for 2 kilometers loss can be around 1 db but for a typical 900 megahertz coaxial cable 
द लॉस कैन बी अराउंड इलेवन पॉइंट फाइव डी बी पर हंड्रेड मीटर सो फॉर टू किलोमीटर इट कैन बी टू थर्टी डी राइट सो फॉर को एक्सल केबल लॉस इज टू थर्टी डीबी एंड फॉर ऑप्टिकल फाइबर लॉस इज जस्ट वन डीबी सो फाइबर सिस्टम आर देर फॉर कॉमनली यूज टू इंटरकनेक्ट मल्टीपल बिल्डिंग सेपरेटेड अक्रॉस दी कैंपस राइट लेट्स टॉक अबाउट दी टाइप्स ऑफ डैट सो इन आई बी एस यू नीड टू डिस्ट्रीब्यूट अ यूनिफॉर्म डॉमिनेंट सिग्नल इन साइड दी बिल्डिंग from the indoor cell using indoor antennas in order to provide sufficient coverage and the dominance so we can have various options available like passive dash active dash and the hybrid dash so let's talk about the passive dash so this is the typical solution of a passive dash so when we call passive dash it means we are using passive you do not require power to make it work so passive dash system tend to use passive components like coaxial cable splitters and the duplexers to distribute signal has and has no amplification characteristic so here is an example of uh, passive dash so you can see here one remote radio unit and that is connected to the antennas with the help of this coaxial cable and the splitters so you can see various passive elements splitter is a passive element you do not need power to operate them right just rf signal right so so the analysis of feed losses is required for proper coverage so care must be taken in choosing the cables and power split value so that the correct input power is input to every antenna to achieve required effective radiated power large diameter cables should be used in the trunk so initially at at this moment so large cable or large diameter cable should be used but more flexible narrow diameter cable should be used between the jumpers and the antennas right so here we should use narrow diameter cable right and a passive network cables usually run maybe between 500 feet to 750 feet so uh, so it is better use in the smaller in building installation maybe in the range of 100 k square feet to you can say uh, 250 k square feet right so this way you can use this right and due to increased loss of feed network the noise floor of the repeaters increase and the hence repeater sensitivity is reduced so the degradation of repeater noise figure must be taken into account in the linked budget as well right so noise floor is also one of the important component in case of passive dash so these are the basic concept of passive dash so the distributed antenna can be implemented using a purely passive infrastructure through a coaxial based component and a list of components for a passive system varies by design but usually it has coaxial cable signal combiners uh, power splitters duplexers antennas and the attenuators and these components requires no external power to operate only an rf signal input right and for passive dash the base station is located in the central equipment room and is connected through wired or wireless back uh, wired or wireless backhaul to the wider network right so passive system tends to applied mostly for small to medium size buildings where coverage is provided by multiple operators in the same building multiple base stations are located in the equipment room and the combined together so that cost of installation of dash can be shared among the operators so in this case it's important to ensure that the combiner provides sufficient isolation among the various operators right and we can use different kinds of splitters and couplers so that we can have uh, almost equal power at the end right this is one example so you can see here that we are only using coaxial cables splitters and attenuators to interconnect our antennas so in passive dash we should try our best so that we should have uniform equal power at each antenna right so we can take the help of couplers splitters so that we can have approximately equal power at each antenna so these are the advantages and disadvantages of passive dash so passive dash are the cheapest option in terms of hardware its architecture is very simple and since coaxial cables are used they exhibit a very wide bandwidth on the other hand passive dash are much more rigid than the active dash if john if zoning is required right or if changes to these zones are to be performed which leads to little scope for upgrading and losses in passive dash can become so high that they can restrict uplink system sensitivity the installation of passive dash is often difficult to a limited banding cable radius leading to slow deployment but in spite of that for smaller buildings passive dash are still the preferred 
solution. And these are the various components in case of passive dash. So for example, first one is splitter. So it divides the power equally to two or more outputs. Then we have coupler. So coupler divides the power from one input to two outputs with unequal losses. Then we have this attenuators. So this attenuate the signal with the value of the attenuator. Then we have this filter. It is used to separate bands from each other. Then we have this BDA. It amplifies the signals and then rebroadcast. And filter is also called as a deplexer, right? A deplexer is a passive filter component with three ports and it enables the sharing of common antenna between two different frequency bands. Then we have this BDA which can amplify the signals and then re-broadcast it. And lastly, we have antennas. It receives or and transmit the signals over the air. Right? Okay. So next is active dash. So active dash is mostly used for large buildings. So active dash need for employment in complex high traffic areas like airports, big hospitals, stadiums, convention centers and other structures over you can say maybe 250k square feet. So imagine we have an infrastructure, a stadium or a building of some sort. So I will use building as an example. Okay. And that building needs some sort of signals, some sort of way of getting signals in and out of the building, right? This may be metallized glass. It may be concrete, right? So these attenuate the signal from outside, right? So if you have tower here, so these signals may attenuate when they reach here because of this metallized glass or this concrete. So cellular signals that might come from some tower or outside reach the building and then they become much, much smaller as they go into the building, right? So some sort of dedicated system is needed inside the building to cover the building, right? So with an active dash, you have couple of ingredients. The first thing that you need is a base station or some form of signal source, right? So this is where you will have a base station. So, so this is here you have this base station. So this base station may be connected to core to the back hall, but that is not our point of discussion at this moment. Back hall. Okay. So from this base station, typically you will have a piece of equipment that will call as a head end or the master unit. Okay. So this is the master unit. Any piece of equipment in the form of dash sign and equipment is typically located with the base station equipment. And then throughout the building on various floors, you will have remote pieces of equipment, right? So if I have various floors, then you have this, then we have this remote unit, right? So this is a master unit and this is a remote unit. Some people call these different things, but generically we call it remote units and the master unit. And remote units are far in the field or, and on the different floors and master units are the local, right? So that now the master unit is connected to the base station by a coaxial piece of cable. So they may be connected through a coaxial cable, right? And there are the RF signals that put into this master unit. The master unit to the RU is typically connected through the optical fiber, right? It can be connected like this. Let me make it yellow because generally in our IB wave design, when I do the design, I use the yellow for the fiber so then it can be connected to this it can be connected to this remote unit right so these fiber optical cables take the optical signals and move them to the remote now at the master unit so from base station you are connecting you are getting rf signal so rf signal is fed to master unit so that master unit those signals are converted into light or the optical signals with the help of fiber and the transport to the remote units. At the remote unit, the reverse process takes place. Additional pieces of coaxial cables are taken with splitters and other devices out to a variety of antennas. So suppose if you have various antennas here, right? If you have antennas, you have antennas, you have antennas, you have antennas. So these are you as connected to these antennas with the help of splitters and couplers? I'm not showing any splitter and coupler, but you need splitters and couplers to join this RU with the these antenna, right? So that is why it is called the distributed antenna system that you have bunch of antennas that are all distributed, right? No surprise here, right? So this way, the active desk work at the high level. Okay, friends, thanks a lot for watching the video so far. Let's talk about the course as well. So here is the link of the course. The link of the course is in the description as well. So at high level, these topics are covered like 5G end-to-end -end concept design and KPIs optimization, in-building solutions, DAS, ORAN, and miscellaneous topics like telco cloud, private network, NFV, SDN, and the network slice. So first we have 
5G motivation and the driving factors for 5G. So this will be our first chapter. So here we will see why we require 5G, why 4G is not enough. So in this we will discuss some practical 5G cases and also we will see studies done by various companies. Then we will go through 5G technology components like new spectrum, FR1 and FR2, beam forming, network slicing, dual connectivity and the cloud optimized architect after that timeline for 5g standards and rollout so in this we'll talk about when is 5g standardized and how wireless evolves from 1g to 5 to know the basic features of previous technologies is absolute necessity only after going through these features we can relate with 5 only then we can establish the motivation behind 5 so this is only way to know what are the features required in future or you can say what are the features missing in the previous technology? So all these topics will be covered in this chapter. Thereafter, we have 5G performance requirements. So in this, we will dissect the requirements which should be fulfilled to call any system as 5G. So we'll also explore the gap between 4G and 5G. Or you can say, what are the enhancements in 5G as compared to 4G? So these are the topics covered in this particular module, 5G performance requirement. Following performance, we have 5G use case. Here we will see what are the diverse requirements for each use case? We will explore what are the steps or things needed to fulfill those requirements. We will also go through various examples to understand each of these cases in a better way. So next module will be 5G spectrum. As we know that spectrum is asset for mobile operators. The available spectrum is major factor in defining how much capacity and how wide a coverage the mobile network can provide. 5G is the first ever mobile radio system that is designed to utilize any spectrum between approximately 400 megahertz and 90 gigahertz. So this is a major plus point for 5G as compared to previous technology which has limited spectrum options. So in this part we'll discuss the different spectrum options for 5G and their characteristics for 5G deployment. After that we will analyze the access scheme. In 5G, there comes a new concept which was not there in the previous technology. That concept is flexible carrier subcarrier spacing. So in this chapter, we'll describe multiple access schemes used in 5G. Also, we'll inspect the 5G numerology and the physical resources. Then we have this 5G deployment options. So we have many options to deploy 5G. No options were available in LT like standalone mode and non-standalone. So in this module, we will see all those options. Eventually, we have five network architecture. 5G architecture is completely different as compared to 4G or any of the previous telecom technology. It used many new concepts like SDN, NFV, cloud computing, and it has various new nodes like AMF, UPF, AUSF, etc. Right? So we'll explore all those things in this particular model. Then we have model tuning. So with the help of model tuning, we can design a model for our network. The aim is to generate coverage prediction and the network planning. Quality of any network depends on the accuracy of propagation model, which is designed based on CW testing and the model tuning. So the purpose of model tuning activity is to tune the propagation model based on drive test and the CW data to improve the coverage prediction. So in this module, all these topics will be covered. Then we have this network slicing. So network slicing is a technique that creates multiple virtual networks on top of a shared physical network. The motive is to provide greater flexibility in the use and the allocation of network resources. Network slicing is used most often in the discussion of 5G networks. The reason is that 5G calls for network slicing as a fundamental capability, whereas 4G and earlier generations couldn't support network slicing. Then we have RAN capacity planning in 5G. As you know that the increasing data traffic in telecom industry poses a significant challenge for the capacity. As the demand for mobile network capacity continues to grow at a rate of 30 to 40 percent annually, it becomes crucial to plan capacity to ensure reliable service delivery. So in this module, all the topics related to RAN capacity planning in 5G will be done. Then we have 5G call flow. So in this, we'll go through UE registration with the 
फाइव जी जी नोट बी एंड दी फाइव जी कोर नेटवर्क रैंडम ऑक्सेस प्रोसीजर आर आर सी कनेक्शन सेटअप प्रोसीजर आर ऑल्सो इलेटेड सो इन शॉर्ट एंड टू एंड कॉल फ्लो इन दिस फाइव जी क्लोर फ्लो मॉड्यूल देन वी हैव नेक्स्ट मॉड्यूल विच इज ओर एन वन सो वट इज ओर एन एंड ओर एन और ओपन रेडियो एक्सेस नेटवर्क इज ए कॉन्सेप्ट बेस्ड ऑन इंटर ऑपरेबिलिटी of ran traditionally the ran products are proprietary then comes the concept of open ran where ru is implemented on the cord server and the interface between bbu and ru becomes open interface so oran allows baseband and the radio unit components from discrete suppliers to operate seamlessly together so here we'll cover these topics like evolution of ran architecture why oran and all these talk then in the part 2 of the oran we'll discuss rick rick is ran intelligent controller and it is developed by the oran alliance the main aim is to enable ai and the machine learning based access to elements in the radio network the ric u artificial intelligence and machine learning applications to automate ran operations and support innovative use cases so with the rec network operators have a platform to deliver new functions and the user experience with a greater agility and the ease and all these topics will be covered in the or and two so what will you get with this course so around 20 plus hours of video learning more than 1000 slides and downloadable summary of the each module and books worth more than 500 dollars and all these things will be covered in this course if i go to the website of this course you can see the website and if you go to website all these modules will be here like we have discussed all these modules are here on this website right and the website link is in the description box as well right so you can see we have 17 modules so far and it will keep on increasing right and all this and if you want the brochure of this training you can download from here from this website and all these things and also if you want to see the testimonials that you can also see and you can see my recommendation on the linkedin page as well so this is the course website right so this is the price of the course for the time being so right now i kept the price just for 9.99 dollars only and or you will get all these things with the course you will also get certificate after completing the training trust me this certificate is well recognized in the industry so all these books will be shared with you the pdf copies of all these books like 5g physical layer 5g nr 5g mobile and wireless communication technology 5g technology 5g system design this is one of my favorite book and network slicing for 5g cloud and for computing network functioning virtualization so all these books will be shared with you and this is about me so as i said i have around 17 years of experience in the telecom industry and for more details about me please go through my linkedin profile i think this course has everything to crack any telecom interview or grow in your telecom career trust me you will not get better deal than this just 9.9 dollars for a complete telecom course and believe me this price will increase in near future this offer won't last long so be one of the few successful people because only you have power to change your destiny i'm confident after completing this course your growth is guaranteed and you will see the results soon so this is a lifetime opportunity for such a small investment therefore be a winner and stand out from the crowd and enroll immediately for this course okay friends this is all from my side again thanks a lot for watching this video and giving me your time please take care of yourself and your families and keep on learning and keep on growing thank you